It was the 1970s movement that saw rock fans chuck out their three-minute pop singles in favour of challenging albums. They were played by flamboyant keyboard players and virtuoso guitarists, all determined to show off their musical prowess. It was progressive rock. This series explores the unexpected origins of music genres we love, which means a long and winding road through the far out backwaters of Yes, King Crimson and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. We'll learn about prog rock's true genesis. No, not that. But the keyboard antics of a forgotten Scotsman who only got into music because of a white elephant thrown out by his next door neighbor. One thing that a lot of prog bands have in common is that they've got great keyboards. You know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, yes, this kind of over-the-top keyboard style. These solo keyboardists were often the driving force behind prog rock. But there's a pioneer of this playing style whose name is not so familiar these days. There were lots of keyboard heroes in the 60s who kind of contributed to that sound. There's Brian Auger. There's Steve Winwood, there's Rod Argent of uh, The Zombies. Um, there's obviously Rick Waitman's playing on as a session musician. But I think the unsung keyboard hero, who never gets any credit, is Billy Ritchie. In the 1950s, in the village of Forth, between Glasgow and Edinburgh, a young lad began the journey to being a future keyboard trailblazer. It was an unusual start in that I wasn't really that bothered about music. Uh, my neighbour threw a piano out when I was about seven or eight, something like that. And in that day and age, anything that was free, you took it in, whether you wanted it or not. You didn't brag about being a poet or a piano player. It wasn't kind of wise. So it was a kind of secret activity. Billy's first band was a rock and roll combo called The Satellites, formed with some school friends when he was just 15 years old. We went to the first rehearsal and they were trying to learn a song and they were really struggling learning it and I was thinking, well, what's the problem? And I played the whole thing and they went, oh my God, you know. And I thought, oh wait a minute, I'm good. The way they looked at me changed everything. It was like, wow, you know, status. In those days, pop keyboard players usually sat at the side of the stage, allowing lead singers to take all the glory. Billy was having none of that. He's actually playing the keyboards, standing up, and uh, he's throwing focus away from the lead singer. Everyone's looking at him. He really is the main man on the keyboards, and that is kind of unheard of. That came about because I didn't want to be one of the backroom boys. I didn't want to be the guitarist at all the limelight. I wanted to be the guy who was out front. What color will you be? In 1964, age 19, Billy Ritchie got together with Harry Hughes and Ian Ellis. They eventually formed One, Two, Three and were drawn to the bright lights and hip sounds of swinging 60s London. Once in the capital, they started playing covers of pop hits in what would later be known as a prog style. A famous Soho music club became their home for a while. Billy Ritchie and his band One, Two, Three have this residency at the Marquee. Uh, it's while he's here that all the greats of what will become prog rock, see him play. We took other people's songs and we tried to find unusual songs. Memphis Slim, I'm Lost Without You. He wouldn't have recognised what we did with it in the end. Among the numbers covered by 123 were two little known songs by two little known artists. They would both go on to become superstars. We took um, America by Paul Simon. Not the one, the Leonard Bernstein one, the Paul Simon one. Paul hadn't even released it yet. We'd been to London with Cyril Stapleton, the band leader who was trying to record us. Nothing came of that, but we did get a demo of Paul Simon. So we said, oh, we'll do that. And I changed them beyond all recognition. 
and reported a greyhound in Pittsburgh. We did a David Bowie song called I Dig Everything. That was the one where I put the... I, did, I changed this tune, I changed this, the whole tune and moved things around and put different verses in and put the Bach fugue and C minor in the middle of it. And of course he heard about it and came to the marquee and renewed our acquaintance and he loved it. And uh, we became, for a couple of years, him and I were great pals. One, two, three were pushing all the right buttons at the marquee. In fact, the famous manager Brian Epstein, known as the Fifth Beatle, signed the band to his management company. But 123's unconventional sounds divided opinion in the audience. People got very angry when we played cause, because they wanted to dance or something and we'd be stopping in the middle and starting new tempo, tem tempo or whatever. And um, they would be furious and there'd be screams and howls of rage. People get amazingly angry. Half the audience were going, what the hell is this? And the other half who were musicians were all going, Wow, you can do that, you can take a song, you can chop it into pieces, you can have different sections, different tempo. Among those impressed by 123 were many who'd go on to become the leading lights of prog rock. John Anderson from Yes was the barman next door at the Shas Club, which was part of the marquee really. And uh, uh, there was the guys from Sin who later became the other members of Yes and people like that. Robert Fripp spoke to me there, and uh, Keith, of course, Keith Emerson, asked me why I stood and played. Inspired by Billy Ritchie and others, Keith Emerson would soon establish a flamboyant style of his own. He then forms the band The Nice, and he goes crazy on the keyboards, stabbing it with his knives and things like that. He's sticking a knife into the keys so that it held the notes going and then started messing about with it to make its pitch go all, and switched it on and off and stuff, you know, to make kind of strange electronic noise. But it's Billy Ritchie who's first doing that in a much more kind of low-key way. Prog had many beginnings, and I think it would have happened regardless of any one influence, but certainly the early Yes King Crimson, Nice, all were directly as a result of that. I mean, that's only a few of the bands, there's probably loads of others. As I said, it happened all over the country. So, Billy Rich is at the centre here. He, uh, he knows David Bowie here, he knows all the great people. They all talk about what an incredible musician he was. And I would argue that if a lot of these people hadn't seen Billy Ritchie play, they wouldn't have taken their keyboard playing even further. It opened their minds. You could do this, you don't have to do a song that way. You can... I never thought of that. I was like that. If it wasn't for the neighbours throwing at the piano, I wouldn't have been part of it. It was one of those, you know, accidents of time and chance. Yeah, yeah. If Billy Ritchie and his band 123 had been a key influence on the rise of prog rock, they were by no means the only one. Progressive rock was. Um, the music that grew out of British psychedelia. Um, like some psychedelic groups went down the sort of like the metal route or the hard rock route. Uh, others kept the mellotron, which was kind of the key instrument in British psychedelia. And then the synthesizers came in, and I'd missed I'd missed that completely. I was still playing organ and piano. And they, <clears throat> Keith and Rick passed me with, like, afterburners on the motorway. By 1971, the new Moog-inspired form of prog was taking the music world by storm. But 123, who had helped kickstart it all, had lost their way. Few would have predicted that during their heyday back at the Marquee Club. Brian Epstein signed us on the strength of that because it was kind of like something happening. Uh, but he died within, you know, a few months of us signing us. Brian Epstein's death in August 1967 had shocked the music world. While the great and the good paid their respects, media attention understandably focused on how it would affect the Beatles. But it was also a blow to Billy Ritchie. 
and turned out to be the one from which his band would never fully recover. Robert Stigwood uh, looked after us theoretically, but he already had Cream, and he just signed this band, the Bee Gees. And of course, he, all his attention was taken by them, and we kind of lost our way in them's, which was the Brian Ep Epstein's company. He had no idea what to do with us. We didn't sound like anybody else. He thought, oh, they put them on a novelty tour. Robert Stigwood sent us on a cabaret tour among jugglers, and because we were so different, people had no idea how different we sounded. So we kind of fell by the wayside. Meantime, all the bands like Yes, The Nice, King Crimson are moving forward, and we've kind of lost our way. We've not made the records. We missed that moment. One, two, three never made a record, but they were eventually signed by Chrysalis Records. They recorded the first of three albums under the name Clouds in 1969. And it's more a kind of like psychedelic pop album, but there are so many prog flourishes on there, especially in his keyboard playing, that if you listen to it, you can imagine what one, two, three must have sounded like at the marquee. But the hold-ups in their career had been fatal. Clouds were no longer a new sound and never made much impact. To add insult to injury, Clouds were accused of copying other prog bands that had, in reality, been influenced by them. I was a bit resentful, but the funny thing is you never say anything. You just thought, well, if they'd have acknowledged our influence, that would have been something. But they didn't do that. Apart from John Anderson, who always said we were his favourite band. It was only in the 1990s that Billy Ritchie received his due credit. His old friend David Bowie spoke up in his favour in a magazine interview. As an unknown, many years previously, Bowie had defended Ritchie after a classic 1-2-3 performance at Epstein's Savile Theatre. He wrote a letter defending us. These three thistle and haggis voice bairns who had the audacity to face a mob of self-opinionated hippies with a brand of unique pop music, which, because of its intolerance of mediocrity, floated us with a Hogarth cartoon and Beano. That was a quote from his letter, printed in the record mirror. So that was when he was unknown. So that was pretty much his take on us. It was nice of him. It was, it was good of him to do that. He always spoke well of me. I mean, he, he stuck up for me even in recent times. While hardcore prog fans lapped up the genre's increasing excesses, its look and sound appeared more and more eccentric to casual listeners. Where prog went wrong, if it went wrong, was uh, that uh, it was experimental within certain parameters, which is crazy because, you, you know, it, uh, the songs got longer, the solos got longer, um, you start getting triple albums instead of doubles which came off the singles. Um, it just became more, more bloated, I suppose. They forgot about sensibility. You've got to keep the sense of a song. You've got to keep the body, the soul. I write a tune and then I write the lyrics, not so much for the idea behind the lyrics, but for the sound of the words. If you're going to be very clever in what you're playing, you must make sure you keep sense and taste there. And I think there was an awful lot of failures in that department. Great playing, but that's not everything. And it got to the stage at the end where every possible gap we filled in, we've got a gap there of two seconds where there's only a keyboard plunger. Oh, let's stick in another 36 notes. I could sit, stick 40 in there. We'll stick 40 in. Uh, let's stick something else in. It just became so over the top and, uh, and overblown. Billy Ritchie and Rick Wakeman had very different careers. One was the forgotten man, the other became arguably the biggest prog star of them all. But they share in one achievement. Together with all the other players in our story of progressive rock, they tore up the guidebook for what could and couldn't become popular music and wrote their own. <laughs> 